Welcome to the Historical Romance Sampler Podcast. I'm your host, Katherine Grant, an award-winning historical romance author, and each week I am bringing on a different historical romance author to read a little bit of their work so you can sample it, and then for me to interview them to find out more about how they do what they do. But since this is our special first episode, who I have with me today is not a historical romance author, but my very special, wonderful, loving, and supportive husband, Michael. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to be the featured author, and I will read from my work, The Viscount Without Virtue. And then Michael is going to interview me with all the burning questions he's never asked me. So thanks for joining us, and let's get into the episode. So I'm going to read from The Viscount Without Virtue, which is book one in the Preston series. I partly chose this because I know it's one of your favorite books of mine. It is my favorite book of yours. Ooh. So um, in The Viscount Without Virtue, the Preston family has realized that all of their aristocratic wealth comes from uh, colonial imports and um, wealth from exploiting enslaved people. And so about 20, 30 years ago, the family decided to divest and they set up their estate as kind of a Regency commune. They only live off the land, and they welcome anyone to come live on the estate, including people who have felony records and who otherwise wouldn't be welcome in British society. And everyone who lives and works on the land shares the profits of the estate. And so in The Viscount Without Virtue, Max, the Viscount, shows up because he thinks this is pretty strange, way too radical, and he is determined to write an expose proving that Northfield Hall is not as idyllic as it says. He's pretty sure there must be some underhanded seedy world there. Um, and so to do this, he is posing undercover as a man of all work who uh, is back from Australia. And he somehow manages to get him, himself a job in the Northfield Hall carpentry workshop. Um, the other person who works at the Northfield Hall carpentry workshop is Ellen Preston the eldest daughter of the Preston family. Um, she's very interested in being hands-on and knowing everyone on the estate, and she loves doing her carpentry. And so she has to share her tools with Max, and she is not thrilled about this because she can tell he doesn't know what he's doing. But she's also very attracted to him, and he is very attracted to her, and so sparks are flying. So the scene that I'm going to read is he, Max has been there for a couple of weeks. He has discovered that being a commoner is a lot of hard work. Um, he's currently working on helping to saw uh, timber. So they have like a big tree trunk and they're trying to saw it into planks. And 13 year old assistant Oliver Chow is very unhappy with him. When Max's hand slipped, Oliver let out a great string of curses, first in Chinese and then in English, ending with, why do I have to work with a child? The Viscount in Max wanted to snarl back. He tempered that and huffed out as politely as he could. I apologize. The youth glared at him. Why are you even here? You don't know the first thing about carpentry. If he had to respond to that, Max just might quit the report altogether. He climbed from the pit instead, ignoring Oliver's question. I need water. Miss Preston, he noticed, was watching the exchange from her work table inside the shop where she patiently chiseled a shutter pole into its proper shape. She looked down quickly, as if she did not want to be caught. Max rattled the water pitcher noisily against the cup as he poured himself a drink. If he had to suffer through pure manual labor, he at least wanted to keep Miss Preston's attention. My father thinks you are a thief, Oliver said from his seat on the timber. Oh, does he? Max considered this. On the one hand, he wasn't fool enough to think Mr. Chow believed he had any experience in carpentry. On the other, he didn't want anyone wondering about where he had come from or why he was at Northfield Hall. Why haven't I stolen anything yet, then? Oliver clearly hadn't considered this and pulled an answer out of thin air. Perhaps you're waiting for the new moon so you can sneak into the house in the dark and slit everyone's throats. Really, Oliver? Miss Preston shook her head, readjusting the clamp of her vice. Max expected her to chastise the boy's manners, but instead she said, then he would be a thief and a murderer. Max grinned. He couldn't help it. She was funny. Gulping down the water, he refilled the cup and sauntered over to her table. It is true that I am a thief. Setting the cup beside her, he winked. 
However, I am only here to steal Miss Preston's heart. She rolled her eyes. Her cheeks were already flushed from the heat, so Max couldn't quite tell if she blushed, too. But he liked to think she did. Before Oliver could respond, Spencer ran up to the workshop. Oliver, father wants to show you how to frame the floor. With less enthusiasm, he said to Max, you're to stay here and help Miss Preston with the shutters. An order Max could accept with no qualms. He waited for Oliver and Spencer to disappear onto the path to the cottage site, then turned to his instructress. I am at your service, Miss Preston. Her eyes, he noticed, had roamed downwards, examining the sweat soaking through his coat, perhaps, admiring the ripple of his muscles, he hoped. You may remove your jacket if you like. Now her cheeks definitely blazed. It is too hot to stand on ceremony. Max could have taken that opening and turned it into something naughty and delicious. Invite her to strip to her smock or offer to remove as many clothes as she looked. He restrained himself to a mere eyebrow raise and shrugged out of his coat. He hung it on a peg beside one of the saws. He removed his necktie too, so that he wore only his waistcoat and shirt above his torso. Still too many clothes, but his skin breathed a little easier with fewer layers. Miss Preston pretended not to watch him. She stripped off her leather work gloves to take up the cup of water. Max noticed the strength in her fingers as they flashed through the air. In a ballroom, they would look mannish. In the workshop, they were competent. She drank the water in long, slow sips. Her eyes closed with pleasure. Her throat moved in greedy gulps. When she finished, her tongue darted out to lick a stray bead of water from her lips. Never had Max found a simple act so arousing. This time, when their eyes met, Miss Preston didn't blush. She held his gaze, an eyebrow tilted in a challenge. One Max recognized. He could kiss her if he wanted to. Max retreated to the stool beside the work table. You did not join your father in London. No. Miss Preston returned her attention to the chisel. Lightly, as if there was no chemistry fizzling between them, she added, I am not interested in the marriage mart at the moment. And of course, there is no other reason for a woman such as myself to go to London. Of course. Max did wonder about her marriage prospects. Lord Preston carried enough of a reputation himself. His daughters would be limited to the Whigs, who didn't mind a radical in the family. Max couldn't imagine any of his peers offering for Miss Preston if they discovered her interest in the carpentry. They would take one look at the wood shavings clinging to her cuffs and leave the room. Their loss, of course. Max wasn't sure he could imagine Miss Preston in an evening gown, much less recognize her in one. She wouldn't be herself without a block of wood in her hand. There are the shutters to complete anyway, he continued. I have been meaning to ask, by the way, how you became such an expert joiner. Surely Lord and Lady Preston did not encourage such a hobby. I am useful to Northfield Hall. Papa has no objection to that. Miss Preston adjusted her position to better angle her chisel against the wood. Martin Chow began his apprenticeship here a decade ago now, and since he is like an older brother to me, I followed him. Curiosity at first, I suppose, and then very quickly I found it much more interesting than anything in the schoolroom. Max had been curious about carpentry too. Only when his father had discovered him following the workers about, the Earl had set Max to twice as many hours with his tutors and lectured the groundsmen on letting the heir do common tasks. I have heard quite a few theories about you, Miss Preston said, chipping away at her chisel. Mrs. Chow thinks you are a common criminal who is too afraid to admit what felony you committed. Others speculate you are a spy here to uncover how Northfield Hall is so profitable. My brother Nate is convinced you are a pirate who has followed a treasure map to our property. Pausing, she lifted an eyebrow at Max. Nate is taken with all things to do with the Navy, I'm afraid. He tried to project confidence. Nonchalance, even. Mr. Sims would not be alarmed by such accusations because he knew he had done nothing wrong. He was only an ex-criminal trying to earn enough money to return to Norwich. To which theory do you subscribe? Max heard how his tone didn't quite sound calm. There was a defensiveness in it. Miss Preston paused, chisel hovering over her wood, to reply, I should like to believe you tell the truth, Mr. Sims. That is the magic of Northfield Hall, after all.
we believe in each other and forgive each other our sins. Of course, that is easier to do if we know what each other's sins are. As if Max would confess his black heart to her simply because she asked. He scoffed, is that it? I thought the magic of Northfield Hall was money in everyone's greedy little palms. Now Miss Preston set down her tool altogether. I have agitated you. No, but she had. And since she had noticed, Max had to do something about it. Find some excuse for why her line of questioning upset him without getting anywhere near the truth. I do believe you, Mr. Sims. There is nothing sinister in claiming to have some carpentry experience in order to get a job. I dare say I would lie too if I needed wages in a scrape. I was only teasing when I mentioned what everyone else was thinking. She was too good-hearted for him. Max hated to have her believe the best in him. One day, she would discover the truth, that he had been lying to her this whole time. And he hated to think she was willingly blindfolding herself to the hints everyone else saw. At the very least, he didn't want her to feel a fool for flirting with him. You have not agitated me, Miss Preston, he reiterated. It is only that I do have something to confess to you a transgression for which I hope you might forgive me. Oh, one word rippled between them. She swallowed, her hands stilled in the midst of brushing shavings from the table onto the floor. And she looked at him in such a way that changed the temperature in the air. Again, Max knew he could kiss her. He could take her in his arms, lay her across the shutters and relish in the sweet heat of her lips if he wanted to which was why he had to confess this lie, tell her he was promised to another, because one day, soon, he hoped, Miss Preston would find out who Max really was. It would be easier for both of them if there was no kiss. He opened his mouth to confess to his fictional sweetheart, except before he could speak, Miss Preston slid from the work table and stepped before him. With him still on the stool, she was almost exactly the same height as him. It's only, before you do, I just, she grabbed him by the waistcoat and instead of finishing her sentence, she kissed him. All right, thanks, that was great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I really love that you uh, read a section from Max's perspective. Uh, I think he's one of the most interesting characters uh, you've ever written. Um, he's so, uh, unlike other characters that you've written, in that he's more of an alpha and actually kind of a villain uh, at the beginning of the book. So can you talk about what some of the challenges are in, in writing a character that is different from your uh, the characters that you usually write? Hmm. I did set out to make Max as alpha as possible, which does not come naturally to me. And so I did find him difficult to write. And I remember with this book, rewriting the first, I really rewrote all parts of it many times. Um, like the same general beats were happening, but I had different things. Like at some point I had their first kiss in the woods. At some point I had their first kiss, like in the middle of a little near the well. I just, I really had to rewrite it a lot because I didn't completely understand when he would be vulnerable and when he needed to not be vulnerable. I think my instinct when I'm writing characters is that they know that they're vulnerable and they are not trying to hide that they're vulnerable or um, they are, my characters tend to trust each other a lot and Max doesn't trust very many people. And so I had to rewrite a lot of scenes where he was being too trusting and I had to kind of pull that back. And the, the initial decision uh, to make him as alpha as possible, uh, where did that come from? Was that, did you see that as sort of necessary uh, for the story that you wanted to tell? Well, I knew I wanted him to be the person investigating Northfield Hall. And I think the decision about the alpha was a little bit of a creative challenge to myself because I had been writing enough historical romances at that point to discover that my natural tendency is cinnamon roll heroes, or at least heroes who are very vulnerable in their own point of view. Um, and whereas the alpha hero, everyone is a vulnerable person, but the alpha hero won't even admit it to themselves until like the end of the book. Um, so I think that was paired with like, I knew that he was coming in with this like kind of villainous goal 
of writing the report and being very arrogant and thinking that he knew it was right. And so I think I wanted to try writing an alpha hero and it served this story to try it here. Yep. And it, it was very successful. Thanks. Um, yeah, do you think that like when you, uh, when you give yourself a bigger challenge, uh, do you end up feeling more satisfied with the work? That it's kind of a leading question, but um, I think if I'm explicitly yeah, going I'm in with a challenge, sometimes I'm <laughs> less satisfied with the work because mm -hmm. I'm more I have more like specifics about what I wanted to do. I do feel I enjoy writing more when I know I'm writing against a specific question or creative challenge. Uh, so this past fall, I put out Three Nights with Her Husband, which is a novella. And for that, I set myself this creative challenge, I guess, where I was only allowed to write about the road trip as it happened at night. So there's nothing about their daytimes. I mean, there's a little like, this is what happened in the daytime. It's only a sentence or two. I couldn't have scenes set in the daytime. And part of that was when I'm really in the midst of just drafting, sometimes it's easy to just be like, okay, what happened next? Well, they woke up and then they had breakfast and um, just kind of like chronicling the day. And then it, that's kind of a trap that I fall into. So it was a little bit to help me get out of that feeling like I was in that trap. Um, and then that was very challenging to have everything that needed to happen in these specific scenes. It, it also put a time frame on the story. And I think that serves the story when you're just reading it because you know there's three nights. And so, you know, you have that in your head, but um, there's like a ticking bomb on the story timeline. But it, it helps me feel fresher and not that sometimes it's like, okay, now I need to sit down and write another story about people falling in love. So when I have a creative challenge or a question like with the Prestons, each book is kind of a question about what does it mean to live with strong principles. Mm -hmm. So when I know what that question is, it helps me think, okay, that's what I'm kind of curious about. And I'm using the metaphor of a romantic love story to explore that. Very interesting. Um, reminds me, so I, I think, I, I hear a lot about artists in different mediums being inspired by uh, sort of constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, I was watching an interview with, uh, the, the singer Caroline Palachek, who's one of my favorites right now. Um, and she was talking about um, how she put all, imposed all of these arbitrary constraints on herself on her new album. Um, like she wanted to write a song that had uh, orchestra hits that sounded sort of natural and without any irony. Um, and that was a difficult thing to pull off. I, I noticed that a lot in, in your writing, um, how there's sort of the constraint of the romance genre um, needing to follow certain conventions with the challenge of, um, you know, you're telling stories uh, from this new perspective. Um, the Something like Northfield Hall uh, is very unique, um, I think. Backing up a little bit, what, what is it that drew you to romance as a genre to begin with? I have always loved the love story in any media that I am consuming. When, like, Disney movies, um, in any novel, I'm drawn to the love story. In any movie, I'm drawn to the love story. In any music, I'm always attuned to the lyrics that are about love stories. Um, even, like, going to tour historic places, being interested in, oh, okay, who fell in love here? It's always just been like a natural inclination for me. It's the thing that is most interesting to me. Um, but for a long time, I felt that there was, that it wasn't meaningful to write love stories. I felt that I needed to be writing more important things. And so I think, like, I started writing when I was, I wrote my first novel when I was 12. And in high school, the stories I was writing were very driven by love. And then in college, when I was studying creative writing formally, I felt that I could not have love in the stories. And it was a, a huge struggle to write because I didn't have the natural momentum. Um, but it wasn't until I was in my late 20s was when I really started reading romance. And then I still had this like, but I can't write that. 
um, until I was, you know, we'd just gotten married and I had some, I'd been in my day job for a while and I was feeling like I was at a point where I didn't have a lot of control over it. And I was about to be kind of pushed onto a path that I didn't really want to be on. And so I thought, well, maybe with the romance category, you can be an independent author and have success and have control over your career. And so I, I knew that I could write a romance because I love romances. And then I could pair it with a type of career that I want. So I decided to try it. Cool. Yeah. Um, everyone loves a love story. They, they are in everything, uh, as you said. But yeah, there's this specific category of romance that gets treated differently. Um, but yeah, it's it's in most of the fiction that we enjoy. Yeah. Um, what I what I find really interesting about romance is somebody who uh, has had very little exposure uh, to the genre, pretty much only through you and through observing your interactions with the community and the things that you tell me about um, and reading your books. I really like that the romance community loves to talk about tropes and like what what are your favorite tropes how what tropes are in this book uh that i just read um and every genre has tropes every, anything that you read is is made up of tropes but um I, I think it's cool that you talk about it and analyze it um and that you sort of think about things in that structure um yeah instead of being like oh i'm gonna defy all right. these things and write the romance novel that's never been written yeah that's not even what readers want readers want something that's predictable which is right. one of my challenges <laughs> and you can still be creative uh, yeah. while falling into the uh the formula or the tropes um even formula i think doesn't have to be uh, a negative word right um, everything follows some sort of formula yeah I think what you were saying before about artists setting themselves constraints, one thing that I love writing the romance genre is that it has this inherent formula and so this inherent constraint where first of all, there needs to be a happily ever after, which I love. Second of all, that you know we know there are gonna be certain progressions throughout of when we'll see the characters kind of come together. And Creatively, that frees me. The writer Olivia Waite has written about how the romance novel, in other genres, each time a novel is written, the novel has to redefine itself and ask the question of, what is this story? What is the shape of this story? Where does the story end? And so with romance, you don't have to ask those questions because you know it. So you mm -hmm. can free up that energy to ask different questions and explore different things. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of setting constraints, I think about this uh, with the show How I Met Your Mother. I think they were very inventive in um, setting themselves constraints, like the story where the pineapple after 2 a.m. And mm -hmm. I just feel like they were constantly being like, okay, we're going to tell this episode from a different story format. Yeah. And it kept things fresh. And I think in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you see uh -huh. that as well. These are all created by Wesleyan alumni and you went to Wesley I did I really do think there's some sort of like Wesley and teaches things that way <laughs> um but I also am stealing that idea because I think it provides for more longevity because you're still working within the ascribed format for them it's a tv episode for me it's a romance novel but I can find new ways to feel fresh and, and find new angles to it yeah that's very interesting do you as you're preparing to write a story or think about a story do you think about um like the the tropes or the specific story beats that you want it to hit or does that sort of arise as you're writing it every novel comes to me differently i do try to think about tropes with my full-length novels i find it very difficult to say i'm gonna have this trope and then actually stick to that the Northwood Hall novellas are a little bit of a creative exercise for me where I am saying it's going to be this trope and like I'll pick like two tropes and then try to put that into the novella and see if I can be successful with that. I think because I have a lot more going on in the novels, trying to add in a trope specifically and hit that trope and do something interesting with it and do everything else I'm trying to do sometimes just makes it such a mess. Um, 
with the Prestons, each sibling has a different orientation towards the family's lifestyle and beliefs. And so my main question for each novel is how does the sibling orient themselves and how does that change? And what can that tell us about having strong principles? And is it necessary to live by principles? And can you be a good person without strong principles? And can you have too strong of principles? And like, that's the like big question of the series. And so each novel I'm trying to explore that through a different sibling who is falling in love with someone else who has a completely different set of principles. Um, so instead of tropes, that's kind of like the thing. But that said, when I was plotting out the series, I did say, okay, this is like Nate's book and he's a sailor. So I want it to be kind of persuasion inspired. And that means it's a second chance romance. And what can I add to this story? So I am interested in the heroine being, um, in Persuasion, they go on and on about how Anne Elliot has lost the bloom of her youth. And so in my, I was curious, well, what if she actually isn't just 28 and doesn't look like an 18 year old anymore, but what if she actually has a chronic illness? Um, so that was, those were like the things that I added that I knew from like before I started writing it, when I started, before I started writing the series, I set up that type of, I guess, a little bit of trope or character information for myself. Cool. And thanks for choosing a reference that I know. Uh, we recently watched Persuasion. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, you mentioned Buffy, uh, How I Met Your Mother. Uh, what are some of your other inspirations outside of romance? I think everything that I'm consuming comes out somehow in my writing. Um, like, for example, I just read, well, not just, but I recently read this pop psychology book from the 70s called Love and Glimmerance. Uh, which was one of the first psychological academic studies of what is it to be in love. Really, it was what is it to have a crush on a person. And so reading that helped me write letters to her love, which is a novella coming out in February, uh, that is very strongly, these two people have a crush on each other, but one of them will admit it and one of them won't. And so it it kind of just like reading this study of people describing what it felt like to have a crush on somebody was very helpful to me to be like, oh yes, I can do this. I can have these people like have a crush on each other. Um, so that's an explicit example. Um, I think, you know, I would go back to like the things that I watch constantly, <laughs> which is the Gilmore Girls in the office. I've watched Buffy a lot. Uh, you know that I watched Married at First Sight for a while, and mm -hmm. that directly inspired the husband plot where two strangers get married. Yes, makes sense. Um, great. Well, now I have a list of. It's time for our segment. Are you a romantic? All right, let's get into it. <laughs> um, which do you trust more, your heart, your gut, or your brain? I trust my heart more. I do try to be rational, but I'm often not rational. And I do try to listen to my instincts, but I often believe in other people more than my instincts. Uh, do you believe in love at first sight? I don't. I believe in lust at first sight, and it can turn to love with the proper nurturing. Okay. Uh, is there a difference between lust and love? Yes, there is. Lust is a very physical thing, and it can exist without love. And I think they also have strong love without lust. Uh, do you believe in soulmates, true love? Are they the same? I don't think they are the same. I think soulmates, not specifically in that terminology, but I do think there are people that you vibe very quickly with, both in terms of friends and romantic partners, and that it's just really easy. Like you and I really easy. Our romance story is very boring. We met, we fell in love. We were like, this is great. Let's get married. Happily ever after. <laughs> no third act break. <laughs> um, true love. I don't know if I believe in that. I think as easy as it is for us to be in love, I don't think that makes it any truer than people who have to struggle to be in love. Uh, what makes an apology meaningful? I think an apology is meaningful, first of all, when you mean it. 
Second of all, I think it's important that you collaborate with the person you're apologizing to to understand what is necessary to them for you to make amends. Um, so it needs to be part of a communication and not just saying I'm sorry. And uh, finally, why is romantic love important? Why is romantic love important? I do assume that romantic love is important because for so long, I felt that it was not important. And so I shouldn't be writing about it. I shouldn't be thinking about it. It would be, uh, it was threatening to my life path if I got distracted by romantic love. Um, it was threatening to my credibility if I wrote about romantic love. And so now I feel that it is important to claim romantic love is important. I think every single person in the world has some sort of romantic love shapes their life somehow. Maybe it's their parents, maybe it's how they fall in love, maybe it's that they really want to fall in love but they don't, maybe it's that they don't fall in love and they don't understand why everyone else is. It's in every single thing that we do, all forms of media talk about romantic love. Um, and I also think it can be a very powerful force for good. It can also be a very powerful force for bad, like a lot of murders are because of romantic love gone wrong. Um, so because it's powerful, so why why don't we prioritize talking about it? Great. So do you think I'm a romantic? Yes, I think that you are romantic in your own way that you sort of define it. You're not you're not somebody who is into grand romantic gestures, uh, which I think is um, something that people are often surprised about you, uh, knowing that you're a romance author, um, knowing that you write these uh, sweeping romantic scenes, but you're, uh, you're a romantic in that I think you uh, value smaller romantic gestures a lot, just like sort of constant little affirmations uh, of love. I think you also, you view love as not so much as this uh, mysterious, all-powerful force, but um, something that you can cultivate. Um, and I think that, yeah, I share the same values, and that's why we're so compatible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, interviewing me. If you want more content like this, Michael is not going to be in the rest of the episodes, but I will be. And we have some very exciting episodes lined up for our first month, including authors Erica Ridley, Charlie Lane, Gina Conkle, and more. So um, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast. And if you'd like to learn more about the Viscount Without Virtue, don't forget to go to the special link in the show notes to grab it for free. So thank you so much. Should we end it with a kiss? Sure.